Ladies and gentlemen, I want <clears throat> to welcome all of you to the fourth of the current criminal law evening sessions program. Before I begin, uh, I wanted to advise you that last week there was an extremely important decision made at Osgoode Hall and one which already has and is being considered a precedent and I think you should all be aware of it because it affects all of you in this room. All of you. The decision was delivered by Brian Greenspan, concurred in by Mike Maldaver, and it was to can these long, boring introductions. As Mr. Justice O'Leary so aptly put it, when he heard that uh, Brian had forgotten his curriculum vitae over at the office, he said this, if I'm good, then everybody will ask about me and find out who I am anyways, and if I blow it, I just as soon remain anonymous. On that note, I give you his honor, Judge Sal Haney, who will be talking to you about recent complaint. When uh, Michael asked me to talk to you about recent complaints, he sent me a letter and said, would you do a uh, paper of 10 to uh, 20 pages. And after reading the material, I had a great deal of difficulty uh, squeezing it into, uh, let's see, 15 pages. Now, reading on further down in the letter that he sent to me, he said, would you talk for about 40 minutes? Now, I have never talked for 40 minutes in my life. I have uh, never delivered a jury charge over 30 minutes. So I'm going to be quite brief today, and uh, after I complete, uh, I'll let Claire Lewis, who has a 29-page <laughs> paper on uh, confessions, uh, review that paper with you. Now, before we come to the examination of some of the recent developments in the uh, law of recent complaints, uh, we should briefly review some of the principles govern, uh, governing the admissibility of such evidence. And the general rule is simply this. What a witness has said on a previous occasion may be used against him by way of an admission. However, what a witness uh, has said on a previous occasion may not be admitted in evidence to confirm his present testimony. And the rule the rationale for this rule is based on the theory that uh, no man will declare anything against himself unless it were true, but that every man, if he were in a difficulty or in view of one, would make declarations for himself. That was a passage from a, an early decision in Hardy, which uh, uh, my secretary seems to have indicated was reported in 1974 uh, state trials and while we do have some state, tri state trials in Kitchener I think that they were abolished a few years ago. An exception uh, to the rule appears to have developed very early in the common law on sexual offenses and a victim of a sexual assault was expected to raise the hue and cry if an appeal of rape was to be successful. Her failure to complain within a reasonable time raised a strong, although not a conclusive, presumption that she consented to the act. It was thought that the true victim of a sexual assault would, under normal circumstances, complain at the first reasonable opportunity. The evidence of the complaint was admitted not to prove the truth of the matter stated, but to rebut the presumption of consent, where consent was an issue, and to allow and to show consistency in her testimony. And initially, the courts would only admit the fact that uh, a complaint had been made. It would not uh, admit what, in fact, had been said. And later, uh, that law was changed. Uh, it was left to counsel for the accused to bring out the particulars of the complaint in cross-examination. And eventually, in the classic case Lilliman, uh, it was decided that uh, particulars of the complaint could be admitted in chief by the 
uh, could be led in chief by the crown. It uh, was generally expected that not only would the victim testify as to the complaint, but also the recipient as well, although uh, there appears to have been an early exception uh, reported uh, to this rule, and eventually the whole issue came up in the Cribs case, decision of the Supreme Court of Canada. And there the victim had complained to a truck driver that she had been raped. <laughs> Unfortunately, she could not be located, and the trial judge admitted the victim's uh, complaint alone. On appeal, it was argued by uh, Mr. Justice Dubbin, as he then was, that since the evidence of a complaint is confirmatory, evidence that is solely, all, uh, solely that of the complainant was not confirmatory of her story in any sense. The Supreme Court of Canada rejected that argument. Mr. Justice Foteau, delivering the judgment of the court, pointed out that, sh that such evidence alone was admitted not to enhance or confirm her story, but to rebut the presumption of consent from her silence. And although there appears to be the view that the victim alone may testify only where the recipient is unavailable, if one took the Cribs case to its logical rationale, there's really no obligation upon the Crown to call the recipient, even if he or she is available. And while uh, that may be uh, something that the Crown may do, that it would undoubtedly invite adverse comment by the defense. Now, there have been a number of cases over the last decade dealing with uh, uh, problems uh, relating to uh, recent complaint, and one of the matters that is of importance is the question of, is a complaint only admissible in sexual cases? Now, the evidence of a complaint was admitted because it was said to rebut the presumption of consent which arose from the victim's silence. And the, where consent is an issue, one expects a victim who did not consent to complain at the first reasonable opportunity. And because of the significance of crime, of, of rape in medieval England, this exception was initially applicable only to the crime of rape. By the 1800s, uh, it was extended to kindred offenses, such as carnal knowledge and decent assault, and then uh, to crimes against men, as well as women, irrespective of their age. In the last 100 years, there's been an attempt to extend this exception to other crimes where consistency of the victim's conduct is an issue. There are two recent cases that uh, are of interest. The first is the decision of Judge McDonald of the Br British Columbia County Court in, in the Frame case. And he admitted the complaint of a young girl who had been forcibly confined. It was his view that since the circumstances of the abduction were similar to sexual assault, it was only logical to admit the complaint to show consistency of, her, of the victim's conduct. And he just, he put the argument this way. He said, the court has to ask the question if evidence of fresh complaint would assist a judge or jury in weighing the complainant's evidence. Why should it be limited to sexual assaults alone? If the nature of the offense is one where the complainant might be expected to complain immediately or soon after it is committed, then surely it would be of assistance to any judge or jury to know whether or not such complaint was made and when it was made. I would think that there are cases where a complainant, male or female, would be expected to complain in the same fashion in which they would in cases involving sexual assaults. And I would think that the court would have to look at the circumstances in each case uh, and determine if by their very nature, one might expect an immediate complaint. The court must keep in mind at all times here the very sound principle upon which the rule governing self-serving evidence is based. This court is aware that it is, a, that it is dangerous to extend such a principle unless there is a very sound reason in law and in justice uh, that it be done. And then he goes on to indicate uh, that uh, keeping this in mind, I would hold that in exceptional cases, where the circumstances are in essence analogous to that of a sexual assault case, that of sexual assault cases, where persons, particularly young persons, are subjected to physical abuse, which, while it may not amount to a sexual assault, it contains within it elements which would arouse feelings of fear, hysteria, 
or outrage within a complainant, then perhaps in these situations, the court should consider extending the rule. And Judge Vanini did in the McClay case, adopting the reasons of Judge McDonald. There the, vic there the, uh, the victims were two young boys, eight and 11, and they were victims of an unlawful confinement and possession of a dangerous weapon. Now, another area that is always one of concern, particularly for the trial judge, is the issue of the first reasonable opportunity. And while early decisions in England indicated that uh, the complaint had to be made at the first opportunity, the courts have now seemed to soften that position and they talk about at the first reasonable opportunity. And they, in the few areas that the trial judge is given a wide discretion by the Court of Appeal, this is one of them. Um, and you have to look at the facts of each case. For example, a young lady uh, who is shy and reserved may not be expected to complain as quickly as a woman of the world. She's been placed in a hostile environment. She may be reluctant to register a complaint until she finds someone whom she can trust and rely upon. She's been threatened by the accused. She may be quite frightened to speak to anyone about what happened. She might be frightened of her parents and reluctant to disclose uh, an experience. Now, I had a case called Pollen, which is under appeal, so I will not comment much further. I believe that uh, Brian is uh, arguing. Are you? Uh, no. In any event, I admitted a complaint made after some 12 hours uh, after the event. The woman was a mature woman. She was divorced with two children. And you had to see her in the witness box. She was, in my view, of such a fragile emotional nature that she just couldn't bring herself to make the complaint. And uh, indeed, uh, she went to work that day and the accused came in. The accused was a customer. He came in that day, said hello, turned around and walked out. And uh, she did not complain until some time later she uh, complained to a uh, rape crisis center. And then it was my view that in the facts of that case, the complaint was a reasonable, it was made within a reasonable period of time. Uh, in the Muse case, which I've referred to in my material, a victim had been dropped off at an intersection a few houses from her home after the alleged rape. She then walked towards her house, past a neighbor, and I presume that she was expected to complain immediately to the neighbor, but she didn't, and she went into her house. Her mother uh, saw her crying and uh, asked her what happened, and when pressed, she told, uh, initially she lied, but eventually when pressed, said she said that a guy had just raped her. And in the circumstances of that case, the complaint was said to be at the first reasonable opportunity. In the Mace case, a decision out of Kitchener's, long before my time, a complaint was excluded where the victim saw her fiance about noon on the day of the alleged rape but didn't make a complaint until 10 p.m. that evening. And so I think one, I think it's fair to say that the trial judge has to look at all of the circumstances to determine whether or not that person, having regard to the events, the emotional nature of that person, whether, a, whether the complaint was recent, uh, uh, recent in the circumstance. The complaint must be spontaneous. As I stated earlier, the complaint should be spontaneous and voluntary, and it must not have been elicited by questions of a leading, suggestive, inducing, or intimidating nature. The reason for this rule is to ensure that the so-called complaint is not something that was put into the complainant's mouth. Now, if we applied this rule strictly, the only type of question that would ever be permitted was uh, a question such as, did uh, John Smith assault you? Uh, and the cases, however, indicate that there's a much wider latitude. Uh, what happened? Uh, what is the matter? That, when you look at some of the cases, you see that those type of qu uh, questions have been put and have been permitted. An illustration uh, is the Kulak case. In that case, uh, the complainant uh, arrived home and was met by her roommate. Uh, who asked her where she had been and if she was all right, and she didn't respond. The roommate then told her that her sister was about to arrive, at which time the complainant began to cry. She was pressed by her roommate to tell her what was wrong, and the complainant replied that if she told anyone, he would kill her. She then went on to s say that the man uh, 
made her do awful things, and that she'd been attacked in the country. At this point, the roommate asked her the question that uh, is every defense counsel's uh, delight, have you been raped? To this question, the complainant responded, yes, I have. And uh, the trial judge excluded the statement because it had been made in response to a leading question. Mr. Justice Martin, in that case, held that the statement ought to have been admitted as a recent complaint. He said, you have to distinguish the situation where words are put into the mouth of the complainant from the situation where the recipient of the statement is merely persuading the person to account for an upset state. And it was his view that in the circumstances of that case, the question whether she had been raped was a perfectly natural question having regard to the nature and conduct of the complainant at the time. And he goes on, went on to say, secondly, the complainant did not merely assent to the words put into her mouth, but went on to describe in detail what had occurred. But uh, he uh, did uh, put one caveat on that uh, uh, decision. He said, a question put by a mother to a daughter who had arrived home late in a disheveled state whether the daughter had been raped might well exclude the response as a recent complaint. A case that uh, does give me some concern because I had similar facts this week was the Bell case. And there a complaint was admitted even though it was not made until after the complainant had been repeatedly questioned for some period of time. There the complainant had been raped uh, by five members of a motorcycle gang and was afraid of what, uh, what they might do to her if she had registered a complaint. And the uh, Nova Scotia Court of Appeal held that uh, in the circumstances of that case, uh, it was still admissible, even though it had been elicited as a result of uh, questioning. Now the complaint itself must relate only to the offense and nothing else. An example of that is the Bellevue case, a decision also of the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal. There the complainant, together with her girlfriend, had accepted an invitation to go for a ride with three men, one of whom was the accused. She then left the truck with the accused, after which the accused produced a gun and forced her to have intercourse. When the truck subsequently returned and she was briefly away from the accused, she complained to her girlfriend of the rape and that the accused had a gun. The parties then drove to a motel where she complained to friends uh, who she recognized at the motel that there was a man after me with a gun and trying to force me into a room and somebody is going to shoot me. The circumstances of this case, the trial judge held that, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the court of appeal held that the trial judge erred in instructing the jury that this latter statement showed that the complainant's conduct was consistent with her testimony as to rape because it did not relate to her having been sexually molested. Another area is the question of subsequent complaints. Quite often a first complaint will be made and then a short time after uh, another complaint will be made. Should both complaints be made or should only one? Uh, what, uh, under what circumstances uh, can a subsequent complaint be made? And the general rule is that only the first recent complaint can be offered as evidence by the Crown. Any subsequent complaint which is separate and distinct from the first is not admissible and no reference can be made to it by the Crown. And an exception to this rule uh, arises where the subsequent complaint can be said to form a reasonable sequence of steps in a single complaint. In fact, uh, I don't think it's really an exception at all. Uh, the court is merely concluding that the subsequent statements are merely part and parcel of the initial or first one. An, an illustration of that situation was the Calhoun case, a decision of the Ontario Court of Appeal. There the victim came home uh, uh, and uh, immediately told her roommate that she had been raped. While she was relating the story, her landlady came into the room and asked her, what is the matter? The complainant then continued uh, with her complaint, repeating for the landlady what uh, she had earlier told her roommate. It was held that the entire complaint constituted one continuous complaint. In the Kulak case, which I discussed earlier, the complainant uh, had been in the process of making her complaint to her roommate when her sister arrived 
and she continued her complaint to her, so a situation analogous to the, to the uh, Calhoun case. However, sometime later, she and her sister went for a walk, and they ended up at a cathedral and spoke to a priest. And it was held that the complaint made to the priest was not admissible since the complaint to the roommate was complete before the complaint to the priest, and there was no nexus between the two. The, uh, in the facts of that case, the complaint to the priest could not be considered as part of a single continuous complaint. Now, an issue that has constantly plagued me is the question of what happens if the trial judge rules that the complaint is not a recent complaint. Now, is the defense entitled to deal with it? Is the Crown entitled to deal with it? Well, if we start with the basic proposition that if the failure to complain raises a strong presum presumption of consent to the sexual attack, then it would necessarily follow that the trial judge should instruct the jury as to the inference they may draw from the victim's failure to complain. And that is indeed what was the sum and substance of the Boyce case, a decision of the Ontario Court of Appeal. The question then is, is the Crown entitled to ask the complainant for her explanation as to why she did not make the complaint. And regrettably, there have been successive uh, panels of the Ontario Court of Appeal who have not dealt with it or have refused to deal with the issue. And the first case was the Mace case. And in that case, Mr. Justice Jessup commented on the problem, even though the appellant had abandoned this uh, argument on appeal. And in commenting on the question, he indicated that no comment would be made unless she was given an opportunity. He indicated that no comment by the trial judge should be made unless she was given an opportunity to explain her failure to make a complaint at the first reasonable opportunity. Now, the Mace case was in 1976, and uh, I'm sorry, it was in 1975. Uh, and uh, within a short time thereafter, was the same matter came up before the Ontario Court of Appeal in the Kistendi case. And there, Mr. Justice Dubbin pointed out that if such evidence were permitted by the Crown, then the defense would be permitted to cross-examine the complainant regarding her failure to complain at the first reasonable opportunity. And then this would create the anomalous situation that, and I'm quoting from his judgment, on such a cross-examination, it would be difficult to exclude the complaint actually made, which the trial judge had already held to be inadmissible. The jury would then be invited to determine whether the explanation given by the complainant was a reasonable one, and thereby be invited to pass upon the issue as to whether the complaint was in fact made at the first reasonable opportunity, the very question of law which the trial judge has determined. And he held that Mace was not binding because it was purely obiter on the ground that the appeal had been abandoned. Well, a few years later, the whole matter came up again in Walters. And this time, Mr. Justice Jessup was back in the Court of Appeal, and Mr. Justice Dubbin was not. And uh, Mr. Justice De uh, Jessup expressed the view that Kistendi was uh, decided per incurium. And he described it this way. An inference adverse to a complainant, complaint can only be drawn if she has been given an opportunity to present any explanation she may have for her failure to make a complaint at the first reasonable opportunity. Any other view of the law is to deprive the judge of the basis for a common sense judgment and to require it to draw an inference in circumstances where they would not do so in the ordinary affairs without asking if uh, there was an explanation. Ideally, the opportunity to advance any reason a complaint uh, has, a complainant has for not making a complaint at the first reasonable opportunity will be afforded during the Crown's examination in chief. There were two remaining members of the panel, Justices Blair and Thorson, and they refused to get involved in the controversy 
or even to comment on Kistendi and Mace. And it was their view that the issue could only be dealt with after a full argument in a case where the issue was material to the decision. Now that isn't really very helpful for the trial judge. Which line of authorities does he follow? Does he flip a coin? Uh, understandably, uh, the rule is that a court is not required to decide a question of law unless it is an issue. And that may be fine in civil cases, where the Court of Appeal can correct the trial judge's decision and settle the issue on appeal. But uh, in my view, it is hardly satisfactory in a criminal jury trial. As I say, it means the trial judge has to flip a coin. And uh, I don't think that people must undergo the trauma and the expense uh, of a criminal trial uh, uh, if uh, the judge uh, flips the coin uh, in such a way that he comes up with the wrong answer. Now, there are obviously good arguments in favor of both. On the one hand, one can understand the concern of Mr. Justice Dubbin, that to permit cross-examination would only transfer the decision as to whether or not the complaint was recent to the jury, and that is not their function. On the other hand, from a question of pure fairness to the complainant, there appears to be no reason why she should not be entitled to give her explanation as to why she did not make a complaint. Her explanation is obviously relevant to the issue of whether it was reasonable to expect her to have complained in the circumstances. Now, assume we have the following situation, which incidentally occurred uh, in a trial before me this week, in which, a jury, in which the verdict was given this morning. A 15-year-old girl who was picked up by three men in a car she was on her way home from a party, and she was offered and accepted a ride. And they drove her into the country. Two of the men uh, raped her, and uh, she alleged in her evidence that uh, they said to her, if you will tell anyone, uh, we will come back after you. They also said that they were members of the Satan's Choice, and uh, I was under the impression that they were all in jail, but I guess uh, she wasn't. She believed what they said. And uh, when she arrived home uh, some four hours after the incident, she was asked repeatedly by her father, and she was terrified of her father. Uh, and he kept asking where she was, and she kept saying, at the park, at the carnival. And he kept saying to her, you were not. I checked the park. Uh, it's been closed for hours. And she repeated this story 10 times. And eventually, he slapped her. And uh, she repeated the lie again, and he slapped her again, and she finally said, I've been raped. Uh, and then her father said to her, I will call the police, and her response was, uh, she was quite upset, and she said, no, they will come after me. Now, on that evidence, the complainant, or the complaint doesn't meet the twofold uh, test, which is that it must be made at the first reasonable opportunity, and secondly, that it must be spontaneous and, uh, spontaneous and not elicited as a result of an inducing, suggestive, or intimidating nature. Even if it can be said to be made at the first reasonable opportunity, it's obviously not a spontaneous complaint, and it should have been ad ad uh, not admitted. But uh, isn't the matter probative? Isn't the fact that she was threatened probative as to the reason why she didn't complain. Surely the fact that she did not make the prompt complaint because she was frightened is relevant to the question of consent. The trial judge has to charge her on the fact that, uh, charge the jury on the fact that she didn't make the consent. Isn't it uh, that she didn't, uh, that she didn't make the complaint? Isn't the fact that, that she was frightened an issue, an important issue? Surely uh, that evidence, if believed, would rebut the presumption of consent that flows from the failure to make a prompt complaint. Now, if I do, if a, if a complaint is admitted on the basis that it was a recent complaint, then the jury are usually told something like this. It is normal for a rape victim to make a complaint at the first reasonable opportunity. A failure to complain at the first reasonable opportunity is a circumstance which tells against the truthfulness 
of her story when she says the sexual intercourse was without her consent. On the other hand, since the complaint, complainant in this case did make a complaint at the first reasonable opportunity, the evidence as to that complaint, the manner and circumstances in which it was made, may be used by you only in judging whether her conduct at the time was consistent with the testimony which she has given here in court. All right, what happens if you rule that the statement was not a recent complaint and is not admissible? The jury are generally told something like this. It would be reasonable to expect that a woman who had been raped would promptly complain to someone of such an outrage. Yet in this case, there is no evidence of the complainant having done so. If the complainant made a complaint at once or at the first reasonable opportunity, that may be regarded as consistent with her evidence. If she did not do so, that may be regarded as inconsistent with her evidence that the accused had intercourse with her without her consent. Although it is open to you as the sole judges of the fact to accept the evidence, the failure to make a prompt complaint is a circumstance which tells against its truthfulness. Now, having regard to those facts, surely we, it would, would it not be a fair, surely that would not be a fair direction to a jury on the facts as I've outlined to you. And therefore, while I appreciate the remarks of Mr. Justice Dubbin, for, her, for whose views, to quote Mr. Justice Galligan, uh, I have the greatest deference and respect, I don't think that it should be a hard and fast rule, any more than Mr. Justice Jessup's uh, view. And I think it will depend entirely on the facts of the case, and that there should be no hard and fast rule. And I don't know whether you have my paper, but if you have my paper, I have said something to the effect which I would like the opportunity to clarify. I've said something to the effect, my own view is that it should be left entirely up to the council. I don't know now, uh, having heard that case this week, whether it should be left up to council. I think it depends entirely on the facts of the case. Now, fortunately, in this case, uh, Defense counsel admitted the complaint. He wanted it in uh, because of the fact that he wanted the opportunity to question the girl as to uh, the fact that uh, she had only made the complaint because her father had uh, slapped her several times and uh, I didn't have to deal with the issue. But I see it as, a, as an important issue and uh, unfortunately it does place the trial judge in a very difficult uh, situation. Now, where there are conflicting versions of the complaint. What happens? You get a situation where uh, the, there uh, is a conflicting version of the complaint between the complainant and the recipient. For example, the complainant goes into the witness box and says that she met her neighbor shortly after the incident and said something like, I was sexually at attacked by uh, George. The neighbor goes into the witness box and says that uh, he was approached by the complainant after the incident uh, and she said to him, uh, George, uh, she said, uh, George raped me. Now, the two are essentially not the same. Is, uh, is the uh, complaint admissible? Until the recent decision of the Supreme Court of Canada in the Tim case, the prevailing view appeared to be that if the two versions contradicted, then the evidence of the recipient failed to confirm the complaint and should uh, be rejected. In the Washington case, the complainant had testified that she had said to her father, Daddy Bubbles Washington broke in and beat me up. Her father, who had received the complaint, testified that her words were, Bubbles attacked me upstairs in bed. Here the evidence of neither was admitted. The evidence of the complainant was not admitted because it was not held to be evidence of a sexual attack upon her. The father's evidence was not admitted because it conflicted with the complainant's and therefore should not be confirmatory. And a similar view was adopted by the Ontario Court of Appeal in a, the Shonius case. And there the complainant testified that she told her foster mother that she had been beaten up and the, father, the foster mother testified that the complainant had said, I was raped by Melvin Shonius. Again, the 
first statement was excluded because uh, it did not constitute a complaint of sexual attack, and the foster mother's evidence was also excluded because it conflicted with the complainants and was therefore not confirmatory. In the Tim case, the accused had uh, allegedly raped the complainant and then drove her to her uh, sister's home. And on the voir dire, the complainant testified that upon entering her sister's home, she told her sister that Larry hurt me, but could not remember saying that he raped me. Her sister, her sister testified that the complainant told her that Larry raped me. And uh, Mr. Justice Lemaire, dealing with the whole issue, summed up the law this way. What then is to be determined on a voir dire in a rape case is uh, whether there was a complaint that is of such a nature and made under such circumstances as to be of some probative value in negating beforehand in some way the adverse effect the victim's silence would have on her credibility as a result of that assumption. The precise purpose for admitting such evidence while limiting its use, it is not proof of the facts, nor is it, nor is it corroboration evidence, in turn suggests, in my opinion, a wide definition of what is to be considered a complaint. In my view, any statement made by the alleged victim, which is of some probative value in negating the adverse conclusions the jury might be invited to make and could draw as regards her credibility had she remained silent, is to be considered a complaint. It will have the effect of negating that adverse conclusion if it is in some way supportive of the victim's credibility by showing consistency between the victim's conduct after the alleged ravishment and the victim's narration of same as a witness. Because it is supportive of the witness's testimony to the effect that she was the victim of a sexual crime, we refer to it as being a sexual complaint or a complaint of rape. This is not to say, however, as some courts have held, that it must be a complaint that directly alleges a sexual attack. I think it is sufficient that the early statement made by the alleged victim be in some way useful to the trier of fact in restricting, if not wholly negating, the adverse effect total silence would have on the victim's credibility. <coughs> credibility. It's a very wide statement, giving a wide discretion to the trial judge. The all or nothing approach, he goes on, that is, letting in only complaints that refer to a sexual attack is hard to reconcile with the very purpose of the rule, the rebuttal of the inference that silence suggests as a result of the assumption. If silence, given the nature and circumstances of the case considered, is to be of some probative value adverse to the victim, then subject to the other requirements of the rule and of the other rules of evidence, any departure from silence is relevant and admissible. It will either help the Crown or the defense, but will always in such case serve the jury in weigh weighing the victim's credibility. Furthermore, not only is the all or nothing approach lacking in logic, it creates the insurmountable problems when applied as a rule. Indeed, assuming the victim did speak out, example as in this case, Larry hurt me, having precluded the jury from knowing that the victim did not stay mute and from what she said, is the judge then to let the jurors infer adversely to the victim to the extent as total, total silence would permit? This query appears to have been present in the trial judge's mind. Indeed, though he found that the statement made by Catherine, Larry hurt me, was not a complaint of rape, he nevertheless left those words to the jury. One may assume that he felt that they were in some way relevant to assessing her credibility. I am of the view that he was right in admitting Catherine's evidence as to what she said she told her sister. For it was, though the trial judge did not think so, evidence of a complaint as that is contemplated by uh, the exception to the rule. He then goes, up, goes on to sum up the rules uh, which must be applied by the trial judge when considering whether or not a statement constitutes a recent complaint. I think that decision is of importance. I think uh, if you read it in full, one gets the impression from Mr. Justice Lemaire that, uh, that the whole question is an issue and uh, will be considered by the Supreme Court of Canada. 
And uh, as I say, uh, I haven't, uh, I've been over 20 minutes, haven't I? My God. I've said enough. Thank you.